if you'd each like to give a very brief overview of where you're from and what you do, that would be amazing. Thank you. Mark, sure. over to you. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Filkowski with Parsons. I'm the president of our Mobility Solutions Group, and we operate here in the Middle East uh, for about the last 50 years or so. I'm based in Chicago, and Parsons specializes in infrastructure and technology solutions. Thank you. Yes, I'm Jeff Bleich. I'm a senior executive at Cruise, which is a all autonomous, all electric powered vehicle company. We're the leading company in that space today. When we have an exclusive agreement with uh, the Regional Transit Authority here in Dubai to provide exclusive ride hail services. Um, before that, I was the United States Ambassador and I was um, counsel to President Obama in the White House. Thank you, Jeff. Carlos. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. My name is Carlos Moreno. I am professor at Sorbonne University in Paris. I am researcher and scientist specialized in cities. I am the creator of the 50-minute city concept oriented for uh, developing more proximity, local economy, local activities uh, in more livable cities. Thank you, Carlos. Cyrus. Good morning. My name is Cyrus Sigari. I'm the co-founder and managing partner of a early stage venture capital firm called Up Partners. And at Up Partners, we invest in technologies that move people and goods cleaner, faster, safer, lower cost on the ground, air, sea, and space. I'm Thanks. based in Santa Monica, California. <laughs> <laughs> We've got lots of sand here as well. It's very beautiful. You'll enjoy it. Yeah, you bet. Thank you for joining me. I'm Cyrus, actually. I will start with you. You know, does the vision for future cities involve, you know, we hear about flying cars, drones, walkable cities, or does it require seamless zoning infrastructure and self-sustaining ecosystems? Yeah. So um, I was really encouraged when I walked in that the very first thing I saw on the right-hand side was a display with uh, a flight simulator for a new flying car, a yeah. company called Joby, along with another company called Skyports, which is creating vertiports for cities. And um, we are living in one of the most exciting times, I'd say perhaps ever. There are over 400 companies developing some sort of flying car. Um, some of them have announced operations that are going to be based here in, in the region, um, and we're going to continue to see that proliferate throughout around the world. But to answer your question, I'd like to just give a little historical context. If you go back to the beginning of the aviation industry, the very first application of using flying machines was delivering airmail in the United States. That's how we proved out navigation routes, how we proved out manufacturing technologies, pilot training, engine technologies. And once the mail got to where we're supposed to get to over and over again, <laughs> and the airplane at the same time, that's when people started to get in these vehicles and use them for, for mass transit. That was about 120 years ago now. Now fast forward to today. I think we're about to see a very similar sort of um, application of using the sky differently and really starting off with drones. Yeah. And so you should pay attention to this. All those that are, are running governments and cities, drone delivery is taking off at a rate that is exponential. Last year we did 1.4 million drone, drone delivery flights. That was a 200% increase from the previous year of about 450,000, which is about a 200% increase from the year before. And the initial application for drone delivery flights has been for healthcare reasons, where we've seen a lot of development has been in Africa, and particularly Rwanda and Ghana, where we're seeing use of drones for delivering blood and, and vaccines. Uh, I also live in Bentonville, Arkansas, which is the hometown of, of Walmart. And right now, if you are a resident in Bentonville, Arkansas, you get on your iPhone and you can have whatever you want delivered via drone into your backyard within minutes. And what's really interesting when you start uh, looking at delivering things with the sky is the consumption of energy. Um, my, my partner Adam, who's sitting in the back here, he's the chairman of uh, Google Wing, Google's drone delivery company. The amount of energy it takes to deliver pasta via drone to somebody's home is less the amount of energy that it takes to boil the water to cook it. And so we think about how much energy we use to move small parcels, which is a significant amount of the, um, the road traffic that's being used. Using the third dimension as a platform to do it really opens up a sustainability angle, and, and also it gets you excited. 
you know, there's nothing more interesting than watching a, a world where you can order what you want, just show up from the sky and show up in your backyard. <laughs> and that's happening right now. And so, like I said at the beginning, it's a heck of a time to be alive to see all this stuff coming together. What we think about, we think about, you know, science fiction movies of old, you know, that is the reality we're living in today. Um, you know, Carlos, why are these sustainable and intelligent urban plans relevant for cities of the future? You know, we talk about the technology, but sustainability is up there, it's key. Yeah. Thank you. I think that the, the key word of sustainability is uh, at the same time three different topics. The first one, to take care of uh, our natural resources, fragile resources, to reduce our CO2 emissions. Yeah. We need to be aware that uh, the challenge most important for our civilization today is climate change. Yeah. And cities play a very, very significant role for contributing to the majority of CO2 emissions. The second point in the sustainability is the economy. We need to develop an economy for fighting against the poverty, for uh, developing more uh, uh, resources. And the first one, this is the sociability. Sociability for fighting against the social exclusion, for having more cities with uh, more solidarities, for more intergenerational, more gender equity. Sustainability, in my opinion, is not only the breakthrough, the technological breakthrough. Technologies are today uh, very, very uh, relevant uh, uh, tools, but it is not a target itself. Mm -hmm. We need today for developing more sustainability to have more livable cities. Yeah. We need to rehumanize the cities. The question is not to have more or not infrastructures. The question is to define in what kind of city we want to live in. Mm -hmm. And today, we need to live in more humanized cities. We need to develop more local economy, more local employment, more local services. We need to generate more proximity. And proximity is not only this uh, metric proximity. This is not only short distances. Proximity is a lot of different proximities. This is the more friendly uh, activities. This is more cultural activities. This is uh, to develop a more uh, feel uh, 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 behaviors between uh, citizens. For that, we have developed with my team at Sorbonne University this concept of the happy proximities. Yeah. The concept of happy proximities is more, we need to go beyond the, the question of infrastructures. Sure. We need to develop a city as a powerful network, a powerful grid with uh, this uh, polycentric way, the possibility for developing all city more local services, mm -hmm. six, six kinds of services. Sure. Housing, working, caring, educating, supplying, and enjoying. If we have the possibility for offering these six kinds of services in all city, with the shorter distances in the compact city, I, I said 15 on foot or 16 by bike minutes, mm. or um, a new kind of uh, low carbon mobility. We have the possibility for increase the most important point in cities, the quality of life mm -hmm. for rehumanizing our cities for developing more relationships. I know I'm slightly biased. I live here in Dubai. You know, we have happiness minister here. You know, it's very high on the agenda. And I think that's a very important point that you're making. Um, you know, but Mark, Mark, how do we keep up with the technology to make all this happen? Oh, there's so many out there and it changes every day. It really kind of <laughs> just blows your mind, right? So I think we really need to start you know, with a smart cities strategy yeah. and then tangible objectives that come out of that strategy. And we've got a really good example here locally, the Smart Dubai strategy. Yeah. It really is looking to transform government services across a wide range of sectors, uh, transport, infrastructure, uh, utilities, communications, urban planning, all those and really unify that. Mm. And then that plan helps inform how do you move forward. Because you think as a government official, and we you know, have a lot in the room, you know, where do you really put your money? You're going to hear all these great pitches and all these great technologies, and that sounds good, and this sounds good. Some of them are competing, you know, doing the same types of thing. How do you really make that, that decision? 
we really have to have that strategy to make sure you're not having redundancy between departments and to make sure that you're also having consistency across the city. So it's not a one-off decision on each technology. It's mm. more of really following that whole framework so you have a cohesive plan that you de deliver to your citizens. Jeff, I've seen you nodding in, in yeah. agreement with both Mark and Carlos from his I last have. answer. You know, how do we make sure that we do design for mo mobility solutions down to the nitty-gritty? Yeah, well, I, I, I think you begin by recognizing that mobility is just meeting a human need. Mm. And then you think about what other human needs can you accomplish while you get people from place to place. And uh, doing it safely, um, doing it cleanly, <laughs> Uh, doing it faster, cheaper, but also um, more productively, giving people time back in their lives. And most of all, I think making it accessible so that everyone gets to enjoy the benefits of it. And that has been the, uh, you know, the, the, we, we, we've had mixed success in accomplishing those other elements mm -hmm. in the automotive space, in part because of the limits on the technology, but the technology has changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. And so we can do things that were never possible before. So for example, we have, and safely. We've, we've gotten accustomed to the notion that people are going to die or become seriously injured just because they're trying to get from place to place. Yeah. Uh, in the United States, 40,000 people are killed on our roads every year and 4 million more are seriously injured. And although the U.S. is a large country, you see proportionate numbers all around the world like that. That doesn't have to be the case. 95% of all of these traffic collisions are based on human error. And so if you can improve the human um, behind the vehicle, it's very hard to improve humans at scale, but if you take the human out of the vehicle uh, and you can train every vehicle to drive safely, then you're going to dramatically reduce the number of lives that are lost needlessly on the road. Um, you can do it cleaner. Um, right now, our, our automotive system is really built around the internal combustion engine. If you move to electric batteries, uh, you can eliminate all emissions uh, as part of this, uh, this, this new, new revolution in autonomy and uh, mobility. So, you know, cruise, for example, it's all autonomous, it's all electric. Uh, we'll take billions of tons out of, of carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, faster, cheaper. Um, you know, ride hail right now is kind of expensive, but if you don't have to pay for the driver, if you don't have to pay for collisions and the insurance associated with it, if you don't have to pay for gasoline, it gets very, very cheap very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. this, this always um, throws up the question though as well, you know, are, are we going to become redundant as humans if we've got all of this amazing machinery and... You know, people always worry about that when you move into <laughs> autonomy. Um, but what I like to think about is in the... It wasn't that long ago that every elevator had a human operator in it. Sure. And there was a strong operators union and people said, well, what are you gonna do if you put the elevator operators out of work? They've got much better jobs than sitting in an operating booth all day long going up and down. And it's much safer and it's much more effective and economic and no one worries about getting inside an automatic elevator. Um, you, you, you know, two other things that are worth thinking about just in terms of the future of mobility. One, as I said, is productivity. Right now, when you're trying to get around, if you're driving yourself, you're just grinding in traffic. You don't have the ability to, um, you know, you, you can't talk to your friends, you can't watch a movie, you can't prepare for your next meeting, you can't take a rest, none of that. Uh, you're just staring at the bumper in front of you, um, waiting for it to move. And instead, we're gonna give people that time back. And finally, what I'm most excited about is the opportunity for these vehicles to give older people who are you know, eventually at some point are unable to um, successfully navigate vehicles and lose the ability to drive themselves, to give them their independence back. They'll be able to get in any vehicle and it's not someone chauffeuring them around, they'll be in a vehicle where they maintain their independence. It's their vehicle, they're alone, they go where they want, no one's gotta you know, watch them while they're doing it and we, we care about our independence, we care about our privacy and we can give that not only to uh, older people, but people with any disabilities or people who live in communities that are underserved by ride hail. So I, I think the future of mobility is extremely, extremely bright because we finally have the tools to achieve all these things. You mentioned the independence there, and Carlos, I think something else that you've done a lot of research into is how do we ensure the human creativity as well as that independence to run alongside the technology, especially in terms of AI? I have a dream. My dream for mobility <laughs> is to switch from the 
constraint to mobility yeah. to chosen mobility. Okay. Today, 80% of, of, of our daily commute in cities is mandatory because I don't have a choice for going from my home to my office and vice versa, the round trip. Two hours, three hours in average. Yeah. We need to change that. We need to, we need to break this mandatory commute for having a choice for working near for, uh, to, my, to my home and to go when I went uh, um, everywhere uh, uh, without this uh, uh, compulsory uh, need. And for that, technology is very, very important, but we need to preserve the common good. The mass transportation, the car sharing, the electrical car sharing, it is a very, very good way. The question today in cities, the very relevant difficulty is one person in one car. They drive alone. Because we have in this case a lot of traffic jams, a lot of uh, uh, distances for just one person with uh, a private uh, pavement from one person, uh, one ton, uh, 20 square meters. Yeah. This is not possible to continue to develop this individualistic commute. Mm. Individualistic commute. We need to, to break with that and to develop more sharing uh, electrical vehicles, mm. more uh, good common transportations, yeah. more automatic lines, of sure. course, more automatic, dry, automatic vehicles, or, but in a collective way. And, and one of the advantages of ride hail, I think, is it, it accomplishes that. It will allow people to collect, have vehicles, take them to the place yes, that they want to go course. simultaneously, and then they don't have to own a car, and that opens up cities. And then the things that you're describing, um, you know, more walking areas, you know, fewer vehicles just taking up space and parking spaces and parking garages. I mean, it really opens up the whole urban environment. Yes. We've been talking a lot about, um, you know, advancements in the technology, the technology of the future. But Mark, how important is old data infrastructure, you know, and how important is it to share that data across various sectors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we we're already swimming in data. And as time goes on, we'll have more and more. But it's really important that we move to an environment where data is owned, organized, governed, shared, accessed in a reliable, consistent manner so that we can all tap into it and really get those benefits out of it. Now, we're working on a giga project in Saudi Arabia right now where Parsons is really developing that framework of how is the data going to be shared between the government, between citizens and the private sector. Because without this sort of organization and some cohesive structure, it just becomes individual data points that really aren't uh, as useful as they could be in terms of getting the benefits out of there. Now, there's a big smart cities concept uh, proposed in a big city in uh, North America a few years ago. And it didn't go forward, and unfortunately, but one of the reasons is that there's a lot of questions about data. You know, how is the data going to be gathered? How is it going to be organized? What's it going to be used for? Security. And, yeah, and data security was a big piece. So really, they, that was a fundamental issue that you know, we really have to tackle up front at the beginning of the smart city journey to be able to make sure that it continues through and we get all the ben benefits from mobility, sustainability, and resilience. Yeah. Cyrus, I'd like to bring you back into the conversation. You're very quiet on the end there. It's your turn. Um, you know, when we talk about mobility at its core uh, in terms of movement, you know, how has investment in technologies in mobility changed recently? So just to set the stage, uh, mobility represents 38% of global CO2 emissions. It is the single largest contributor to CO2 emissions in the world. It's also a $10 trillion market. It's a huge industry that is also perhaps one of the most visible as it relates to an area of opportunity, particularly when you talk about climate refugees and all that sort. So really exciting news in that in the last 10 years, there's been a 30x increase in venture capital and mobility-related companies. Hmm. It's been about $330 billion since uh, 2013 to today. About 80% of that is on ground, about 10% in the air, 10% sea, and only 1% in, in uh, rail, because rail only represents 1% of CO2 emissions. It's actually an exceptionally uh, efficient means of getting things around. Uh, so, so it's become perhaps the like, if you look back to the beginning of the internet where venture capital started to get really exciting around internet tech, mobility has become that. 
So be it flying cars or drones or autonomous cars or all these different modalities of hydrogen for powering airplanes and buses and you, you name it, it's completely different than it was 10 years ago. And I, I just give one anecdote as it relates to the conversation around autonomy and AI. Uh, there's this really cool video of, of Steve Jobs where he's talking about technology. And he, he references this study that was done in uh, some magazine where they studied the efficiency of various animals from a mouse to a human to a dog to a condor <clears throat> and how efficient it was in its movement. And it turned out the most efficient was a condor and a human was about 50% as efficient as all the other ones in terms of how it consumed. However, if you put a human being on a bicycle, it was twice as, as efficient as a condor. And it was this really great moment of showing what, what is it that makes us distinctly human, which is to create tools to allow us to do more things and to give us our time back to do the things that really matter. And in my opinion, those two things are being creative and sharing love. And I think the technologies and all the things we're talking about here allow us to have more time to, to do those two specific things. I think we've all touched on the issue of climate throughout this conversation, mm -hmm. you know, but, and we keep hearing this, I'm not saying anything, you know, revelationary here, but you know, we're up against it. How, how are we going to implement all of these things when, you know, we're on the back foot already? Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're seeing, finally, the movement to electric vehicles across the board. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're doing it, but we're, uh, we're not alone. Uh, General Motors and Ford and the major manufacturers all over the world have committed to um, sunsetting internal combustion engines and being fully EV by the end of this decade. I mean, that's an extraordinary shift. It's overdue, frankly, mm. but it's, uh, that, that is the future. Um, one thing that we're going to be challenged with is that with every new solution comes some new problems. So one thing is we've got to reduce our, our you know, dependence upon fossil fuels in order to um, generate the electricity that's going to power these vehicles. Uh, we're going to get much more efficient with the vehicles and also the computing power that that supports all of this great technology, uh, that's a bit of an energy hog too. And so we're gonna have to support that with new technologies. But between, um, b between what you're seeing with um, uh, improvements in nuclear, improvements in solar, improvements in um, uh, wind and, and, and um, hydro, I think um, particularly hydrogen fuel cells, um, using that to generate the the power which will then you know, support these technologies will allow us to really dramatically, dramatically reduce um, uh, our carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, Cyrus, I think you had something to add into this. Yeah, so real interesting data point that we just came out with a research report around the future of mobility and some insights around this whole electrification thing. I've owned three Teslas. I love electric cars. <laughs> so, but I will tell you, between now and the year 2030, there's, an, there's a prediction that we're gonna need 10X the number of lithium ion batteries that we have today based off of various companies' commitments. Just in the last three years alone, we saw an 800% increase in the lithium price index. So we have a lot more lithium that we want to go put into cars. And it's not just lithium, you got cobalt and nickel, which you have the three main constituents. They're effectively the future oil to power these things. You've got a dislocation as it relates to the uh, supply and demand, which could create a secondary crisis. As companies continue to go down this pathway where you could have prices actually end up going up to, if there isn't a very metered approach to how to bring on this electric future and that we don't swing the pendulum back too hard the other way as a result mm -hmm. to recover. Carlos, we, we, we're hearing about all this positivity and that we're, we're going the right way. You know, what is going to be the immediate challenge, the biggest immediate challenge for us? The big challenge today in mobility is to reduce our CO2 emissions to Further. have a more um, human and livable city. And the future of mobility, in my opinion, is not only the future of cars. Yeah. The future of mobility is as well and mainly the world capability in cities, the bike capability mm -hmm. in cities, the new infrastructures for developing shorter distances, for developing uh, this new kind of mobility without uh, CO2 emissions. To discover my city uh, on foot, we have the possibility for exploring 
a lot of different proximities. Mm -hmm. Discover my city by bike. This is the possibility for having a more of friendship uh, mm -hmm. life. Yeah. And if we wanted to explore technologies with the, the new kind of uh, 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 smart bikes, we have the possibility for going, going so far. Mark, final word, you've got 30 seconds. How do we make sure that that efficiency is met? Well, forwards. I, I think we you know, think a lot about the future as we should, but really most of the infrastructure that we'll have in 10 years is already out there today. So we really need to make more efficient use of what we already have, digitize that infrastructure, um, make it more efficient. The O&M piece, we've got to drive down the cost there. It can also help out on the emission side, too, as we run that more efficiently. So really, I think it's looking forward, but also looking at what we have and what, what can we do better with what we have today. Gentlemen, bang on time. Thank you so much. It's been <laughs> thrilling to be here with you. We could have talked all morning. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Mark, Jeff, Carlos, and Cyrus. Thank you. Thanks.